Our title is uh, Everything is a Gift. Now we all know that. I hope we do with our logical mind. But that's not the mind that matters. There's a different mind that includes the whole self. And that's the mind that has to know that everything's a gift. And we always need in prayer practice to find ways to go to that truer self, that deeper self, that prayer self, that contemplative self, so the cells of our body know that everything is a gift. Recently I was attending a class by a Jewish rabbi in New Mexico where I live, and he taught me something that I was really ashamed I had not learned years ago. I don't know why none of my scripture professors never told me this. But he pointed out that the unspeakable name for God that they were not allowed even to pronounce, we pronounce it Yahweh. Uh, As you perhaps know, uh, when Hebrew is written, you only write the consonants and you fill in the vowels. They're not written. You know what the vowels are. That much I knew, but he pointed out to me that this word, this unspeakable word for God, which can give you the impression that you have God captured, that you have the name for God, that you understand God. And he said, the Jewish people, we had to be taught a foundational humility around the mystery of God. So we never presumed we understood like too often we do. And that's why we couldn't pronounce it. But it gets better than that. He said, do you realize that even in the spelling and in the pronunciation, the three different consonants that are used in the spelling of the word Yahweh are the only Hebrew consonants that do not allow you to close your lips. Yeah. I almost wept. I realized what they were saying, what they were realizing so deeply, that um, God was uncapturable in any form, even by our words, even by our mouth, and that this God was as available as the air inside and outside of your lungs. And the only thing that you have done ever since the moment you came out of your mother's womb is you have taken in that breath. You have inhaled and you have exhaled. And that moment will come with the last inhalation and the last exhalation. But in between, there is something that is always happening always available, always accessible. Without it, there is no life. And he pointed out that what the Hebrew tradition was saying was that God is as available, as accessible, as free as the very air. And still, we cannot see the very theme of our weekend. Maybe we cannot see, maybe we cannot feel the universal gratitude that proceeds from this awareness because it has remained largely in the head, a doctrine of belief, but not an experiential knowing. D.H. Lawrence said, you can do whatever you want with a belief, but an experience does something with you. You're not in control anymore. The experience is. And I think why we see in so many parts of the world why institutional religion in all of its forms, Christianity, Islam, Judaism, the great monotheistic religions, all seem to have come to a kind of impasse. We say, how do we get to this point? I think at least one reason is, in terms of our theme today, 
we try to be grateful with our head. You can't. You got to be grateful with your whole being. You can't know this mystery by head knowledge. You have to know in a deeper way. Now I, in my own teaching, have tried to distinguish and will develop it more tomorrow between what I call the calculative mind, the normal mind that judges and critiques and analyzes and fixes or tries to fix, and the contemplative mind. And every religion at its more mature levels teaches some form of meditation, contemplation. Our, our normal word for it has just been prayer. But that's the self that can know that everything is a gift. The logical mind, your logical mind, mine, it will think of all kinds of things that are not gifts. It'll think of all kinds of things to complain about that aren't uh, like we think they should be. As long as you stay there, you won't get very far in this realm of spirituality that we're talking about today. And that's why it's been so important to have music and mime to some way try, although it's hard to do with Christians, to get them out of their heads. Because <laughs> we're convinced that we can solve the problem up here. And I want to convince you, you can't. <laughs> this only becomes a control tower. That's really what it is. The mind does not really search for truth. It search for, searches for control. It wants to know where it is. On the, in the pecking order of everything. So God has to lead you to a different and a deeper and a broader place. That's why I said this morning only things like birth and death are strong enough to do it. Very often suffering in some form. Every other, every other way you'll try to figure it out. You know, you probably think being a public speaker that it must be great to be standing up here and be in control of 700 and some people. But I want to tell you something. I'm not really in control. You are. Oh yeah, I'm sitting here talking. But 700 and some minds are sitting out there looking at me, deciding moment by moment whether they like what I'm saying. <laughs> whether they agree with it, their mind can easily dismiss it and say, oh, that's too liberal, that's too conservative, that's too Catholic, that's too Protestant. My gosh, he's even mentioning Jews. Maybe, it's, maybe he's Jewish. That's what the mind does. It just keeps going around, searching for control, searching for preeminence. Now, that's why the spiritual teachers always say that if you're going to get very far, you cannot judge. The judging mind, quite simply, is the mind looking for control, not looking for truth. So actually when you stand up here, and I know many of you have experienced it if you've been in a public speaking situation, it's actually a very vulnerable situation because you know hundreds of minds are liking you and disliking you, loving you and rejecting you moment by moment. If you're not free to accept all of that positive and negative energy, you, you, you wilt before the event. So you have to try to find a different place from which to speak. A different place in a certain way that doesn't care too much <laughs> uh, whether everybody agrees or everybody likes it. And that's that deeper place of gratitude that we're going to try to describe. The attitude of gratitude where something is so good and so right and so okay that all of the other little complexities and complications and rejections don't bother you that much anymore. That's where I want you all to be by the time you leave here tomorrow. That's why we don't so much say prayers, brothers and sisters, as eventually we become a prayer. And when you stand in that place of communion, what Merton would have called the true self. What you, when you stand consciously in that place of conscious union with God, then the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, the judgments and criticisms of people, 
They still hurt a little bit, but not so much. Because you know who you are apart from this horizontal game of what do people think of me. There in that world, you'll never be grateful. You won't. So we've got to get you to a different world. Now let me try to develop it in this way. Uh, We're going to come back to the prayer theme tomorrow, which is really the only place to learn the different mind, the different consciousness, the different stance in this world. But I'm going to describe it for now as two different worldviews. There's the worldview of entitlement that begins with, as most Westerners begin, certainly most Americans, I deserve. It's very deep in most of us. I have a right to. I have earned. Now, if that's your starting place, you're never going to get to the attitude of gratitude. You'll never be able to know that everything is a gift. Because when you start with, I have a right to, I deserve, and I'm afraid we do see it, certainly in our younger people, almost as a way of life. The older folks who had to suffer a lot more for what they got don't don't tend to move to that sense of entitlement quite so quickly. But when you start there, you start, of course, with an awareness of your incompleteness. I don't have. I am not. And so always your happiness appears to be over there in another person's response to you or in another possession or or, uh, fancier clothes or uh, it's always outside yourself. And brothers and sisters, happiness is always an inside job. There is nothing outside the self that can give you substantial happiness. It can only come from within. By that union, that communion with the Holy One, with all things, whereby uh, you draw upon the deepest level of reserves and resources by yourself. You don't need all of these other things to tell you who you are, to tell you that you're important or that you're, you're needed or loved. You're drawing your love from that deeper place that we talked about this morning. That's a secret to spirituality. All the rest is just words until that happens. And until you switch engines, if I can put it that way, and stop drawing upon this Richard self, small self, horizontal self, that self will always feel inadequate. And it is. It well should be. (laughs) It has no metaphysical substance. We would say philosophically that's what doesn't exist. The true self is who you are in God and who God is in you. That self begins not by a sense of incompleteness but begins with a sense of completeness. (laughs) It's already okay. I have all I need. Now, on some level, I have to believe that every one of you in this room has experienced that on some level. Or I don't know why you'd even come to a day like this. Why would you search for spirituality? As a general rule of thumb, all spiritual knowledge is recognition, not cognition. You don't know it. You say, I already know that. It's a discovery of something that has already been spoken within you. Some have said a a true spiritual teacher, therefore, is a midwife. They're pulling the baby out of you. They're naming the divine indwelling, the presence of the spirit that's already there, but you often don't know it. The best compliment I ever get after a conference or retreat, and it doesn't sound like a compliment at all when they first say it, But very often, it'll probably happen here, too. Someone will come up and they'll say, Richard, you know, I listen to you all weekend, and you say things a little different sometimes. and Sometimes they scare me a little bit. But on a deeper level, you didn't tell me anything I didn't already know. That's the best compliment I get. You already know this if it's true. 
if it's real and if it's good and if it's from God, all a spiritual teacher can do, all a preacher can do is awaken it and say, come out, come out, it's there. And that's why true faith knowledge has, has such conviction to it. Because you're not just believing the word of the preacher. It's like all the preacher does is touch the deeper awareness and you confirm people's deepest intuitions and then you don't say, Richard told me, but hopefully next week you'll be saying, I know, I know. Speak for yourself. I have experienced and I have come to know, I have come and seen the beautiful theme of our whole retreat. So, in contradistinction to the worldview of entitlement, which always leads to a sense of scarcity, zero sum, there's never going to be enough, there's never going to be enough, fear, anxiety, greed, competition, comparison, you could say all of the capital sins, in a certain sense, come from this foundational fragility of, of the human soul apart from God. It's intrinsically insecure. It's intrinsically unhappy. It's intrinsically ungrateful. I deserve that. I needed that. If, if you still need something outside yourself to be happy, I don't think you're ever going to be happy. Because <laughs> even when you get it, you know what's going to happen? You're going to realize it didn't satisfy you. Because it can't. It's outside you. And so what you'll do is you'll up the ante. The alcoholics say it very well. They say you always need more and more of what doesn't work. Hmm? That's the nature of all addiction. Any of you who are addictive workers, you understand most people are addictive in some area. And they just keep thinking, okay, last week's dress didn't do it. I'll go to a fancier store. I'll pay 20 more pounds. You know, When I put on that dress, I'll feel like a million dollars, as they say. You probably won't. I can tell you ahead of time and save you the money. Huh? <laughs> if you don't feel like a million dollars before you put on that dress, you're not going to feel afterwards. All right? And what we sell out for so much is this world of forms, forms. You're going to become infatuated and addicted to forms if you haven't experienced substance. Even religious forms. And, and much of immature religion is exactly that, just getting all lost in, in creating the container and never getting to the second half of life, what I call the contents. And everybody just fights over, my container's better than your container. Hmm? Who cares? You know? <laughs> have you experienced the contents? Most, most denominations have divided over the forms, over the container. And you want to ask people in, in both cases, have you experienced the contents? Have you experienced the substance? And there's almost a perfect correlation between your preoccupation with forms and window dressing and externals and rituals and legalities and your lack of experience of the real thing. The real thing satisfies at a level that satisfies. Jesus calls it the peace the world cannot give. No one else can give it except this experience of union with God. And the world can't take it away from you. The peace the world cannot take. That's what it's all about. I know without knowing you personally that that's what every human being wants. It's what we were created for. There's, as many have said, there's this God-shaped hole inside of us. And so God gives us just enough of God. That's the indwelling presence. And it becomes like a homing device. It makes you satisfied with nothing less than God. And everything else always disappoints. Always disappoints. It's okay. It's a tease. That's all. You know? It's a little sample God keeps giving us free samples. But you always know it's, it's not yet the real thing. It's only to draw you onward, onward. And eventually, by the middle of life, hopefully you find out what it is you really desire. That's much of my work in spiritual direction. Getting people in touch with the deepest level of the, their desire. 
and what they think they desire and what they really desire is, is very often two different things. The deepest desiring, ironically, doesn't come out of emptiness. It comes out of fullness. So the other thing, opposed to the worldview of entitlement, is the worldview of abundance. The worldview of sufficiency. The worldview of that it's okay. Everything I need is right here, right now. I want to be honest with you. I've only tasted this in great part. I think I tasted it in small part as a young boy. And it's probably why I became a Franciscan and a priest. But now as I get older, I'm learning how to live there. Missed connections and whatever else. So I have to say, okay, God, whatever happens, it's okay. Now, I don't always live up to that. I promise you. But if I can say that, if I can mean that, that you're in this and you're in that, you're in the missed plane, you're in the uh, not-so-friendly person, uh, you're in the person who wakes you up in the middle of the night or whatever it might be, somehow, God, you have a lesson for me in that. When I can live that way, I am happy. I mean, it's amazing. By the middle of life, you all have to decide And I think Christians have a hard time deciding this. Do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? And what you find, I think, and I'm sure I'm speaking of Americans much more than English, but most Americans want to be right. They don't want to be happy. It's written all over their face. They don't want to be happy because they let everything make them miserable, you know? Because I'm so often in airports, you know, I feel so sorry for these poor girls at the gate or who are giving you your boarding pass because their plane was delayed for half an hour. You know, they come and they yell at this poor young woman. She has no control over the plane. But you've got to scapegoat somebody. You know, if you're not happy in here, you've got to make other people unhappy with you for some reason. you just got to pull them into the mud. That's, that's a large percentage of people I've ever known. All great religion is about what you do with your pain. And if you do not transform your pain, right hand raised, I swear this to you to be true, if you do not transform your pain, you will always transmit it. With 100% certitude, you will transmit it to your children, to your husband, to your parish, to England, (laughs) to the society, to the neighborhood that you're a part of, everybody else has to deal with your garbage because you yourself have not held it like Jesus did as he held his pain and let it transform him. You see, pain in the spiritual life, in all of its forms, emotional, relational, physical, social, it's the only thing strong enough to destabilize the ego. Sorry that that's true, but tell me what else will do it. There's no way you're going to let go of this private little sense of self and how important you are and what you deserve and how you've been hurt and how you're a victim and all the pity parties that we get involved in. And for some people, this just becomes a way of life. Victimhood as a way of life, you know. I have been hurt more than you've been hurt. We make an art form of it in our country. You know? It's really a way of getting control to prove that you're the ultimate victim. You know? And no one can touch you at that point. Did you realize that? No one can touch you once you play the victim. You know? And it's always a person who has not come to that adequate sense of self, so they're looking for your notice or your affirmation or your validation. Again, they're looking for something outside themselves. The entitlement self is always saying, I deserve more. The true self, the God self, the united self, the sufficient self, the abundant self, says everything is a gift. I didn't even deserve this moment of life. One of you asked me while driving me here this morning um, that you'd heard I had bad health And I said, oh gosh, that was 14 years ago. Thank you for caring and remembering that long. I had cancer in 1991 and they gave me six months to live. Obviously, 
Here I am. It didn't work. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I can't thank God enough for that. I think because I've been so public for so long, God needed to remind me that I was going to die and that I'm not essential to anything. And I had to face in my late 40s my own mortality. It was without doubt one of the most wonderful things in my life. And any of you who have been in that place, you know, you live very differently afterwards. In the book Adam's Return, I mentioned that at the core of every initiation rite I studied, always they tried to communicate to the young man that somehow in some way or some form he had to die before he died. If that doesn't happen, you don't begin to live. It's almost that simple. And if who you think you are, what you think you need, what you think you deserve, what you think you have a right to, that's what has to die. It all falls apart, usually in one great piece, where you see it's all a charade, it's all a game, it's all a mind game that keeps you perpetually unhappy, perpetually accusing others of not meeting your needs. And they don't have to. It's wonderful when they do. But when they do, you say always, it's a gift. Thank you. Thank you. You didn't have to do that. <laughs> I've met so many loving people in your country in the last few weeks who, who just seem to uh, have that, that level of caring that does delight the soul. But those are gifts we give to one another, and they're always in a certain way, in a real way, undeserved gifts. So the entitled self to use our metaphor, always sees the cup half empty. Or, or the, yes, the, the entitled self. And the sufficient self always sees the cup half full. They're different starting places. Now the question we're asking today is how do you get your cup half full? <laughs> well, it's called healthy religion. A lot of religion isn't healthy at all. It's just an attempt to feel spiritually superior to other people, which is still ego at work, still the inadequate, insufficient self. But uh, the realigned self, the reconnected self, the self that has been led to the edge of its own resources and now starts drawing upon a deeper level of resource, the true self, the God self, that's the self that lives with the cup half full. They can see that everything is a gift. Even little things can begin to delight you. Every few years I get to make a hermitage for Lent. Next year is my year again. So in Lent I get to go away. First days are sometimes a little difficult. You have to almost pull away from this world of appearances and addictions. Um, but little by little you learn how to live in the now. You learn how to let just ordinary, momentary things delight you. And often I start feeling again like a human being. And I say, why don't those things delight me on ordinary days? Because we've even upped the ante of entertainment and stimulation. It always takes more and more and more and more to satisfy us and make us happy. So what we do, this is why Francis went to the cave, is you just go back to zero and say, can this make me happy? Let me read a story that says this much better than I can say it. I read it in a book, a novel, I think it was years ago, and forgive me that I can't remember where it was. One of you will know and come up and tell me, I'm sure. Once upon a time, a small Jewish boy went to his rabbi, and he said he didn't know how to love God. How can I love God since I've never seen him? Just as you and I would say, perhaps. I think I understand how to love my mother, my father, my brother, my little sister, and even the people in our neighborhood. But I don't know how I'm even supposed to love God. The rabbi looked at the little boy, and he said this, Son, Start with a stone. Try to love a stone. Try to be present 
to the most simple and basic thing in reality. So you can see its goodness and its beauty. Then let that goodness and beauty come into you. Let it speak to you. Start with a stone. The boy nodded with understanding. Then, after a while, probably a few years, after loving stones, the rabbi continued, you can go on to the next grade. Try to love a flower. See if you can really love a flower. See if you can let its life come into you and you can give yourself to it. It's the Trinitarian mystery of communion and presence. You don't have to pluck it to enjoy it. You don't have to possess it to enjoy it. Don't destroy it. You can just love it over there in the garden, growing as it is. Let it delight you. Learn to love a flower. Lesson two. The boy nodded. I'm not saying it's really wrong to pick flowers, added the rabbi. I'm just asking you to learn something from the flower without putting it in your vase. The boy smiled, which meant he understood, or maybe he really didn't. But just in case he didn't, the rabbi then pulled the boy's pet dog as the next object of loving and listening. And he said, Do you love your dog? The boy, of course, nodded and smiled when the rabbi talked about his dog. Oh, yes, I love my dog. Then the rabbi went on. Try to love in sequence the sky and the mountains and the beauty of all creation. Try to be present to it in its many forms. Let let it speak to you and let it come into you. The boy sensed the rabbi still wanted to say some more, so he nodded as if he understood. But of course, he had not grown to that level yet. Then the rabbi said, Then, finally, after you have loved a stone and a flower and the skies and the mountains and all creation, then you're ready to love a person. Try to be faithful to that person, to sacrifice yourself for their good. After you have loved them, you'll be ready to love God. St. Bonaventure, our Franciscan mystic, he called it the great chain of being. And he said that when we stopped recognizing the divine presence in the lower levels of the great chain of being, It was an all-or-nothing proposition, as I told you this morning. And sooner or later, the whole thing would fall apart. He was building on the intuitive vision of Francis himself. And he said, just as this story does, the lowest link in the chain of being was the rocks and the minerals and the earth itself. Then the plants that grew from the earth. Then the waters upon, or the waters first. And then the plants. And then the animals and then the humans, and then the angels and saints, and then the divine. And Bonaventure said, if, if you don't see God at all levels pretty soon, you won't see God at any level. We now live in a world where it's almost hard for us to see the divine image in the human level. <laughs> in fact, we don't, by and large. The great chain of being seems to have fallen apart a long time ago. And we make our leaps into spirituality and into human love without first learning to love ordinary things, simple things. Thomas Merton one day was talking to the assembled abbots and priors of the American monasteries. And he said, my gosh, we have all these young monks coming to Kentucky and wanting to be contemplatives. And he says, I'm convinced we should not teach them any contemplation till they stop slamming doors. <laughs> he says, we're wasting our time leaping up here to this high level of supposed 
awareness and consciousness and communion when he put it so well, as he often did, we can't even stop slamming doors. We're that dissociated with the moment and with other people and with the reverence that all things deserve. More than anything else, brothers and sisters, the spiritual journey is recognizing the sacrament of the present moment, that it's all right here, right now. And you know, if it isn't right here, right now, I'm just going to be honest with you. It's not going to be tomorrow morning when you go to Mass either. So you might as well get it right now, right? Either God is present in this world, even in all of its brokenness and foolishness and silliness, or he isn't. And, and, and so sooner or later there has to come a moment where you surrender to that and you accept that. But what we all think, and I've been there too, is tomorrow will be different. It won't. It won't. <laughs> You'll be the same tomorrow as you're, you're doing it right now. So let's say you're sitting there. I'm sure you're not. Judging me and critiquing me and analyzing me. Do you know what? That's actually saying much more about you than it is me. Because that's probably how you do everything. Did you know that? That the way you're judging me or this moment is the way you judge your wife and your children and your world and probably the God self. And that's why I said this morning, it all begins with you. You've got to clean this lens if you're going to come and see. This is where the seeing happens. And how you see is how you see. (laughs) And that's what's going to come in. And if you see everything as a problem, everything as, as a paranoid attack upon you, that's probably the way you see. And that's probably going to be true five years from now. Unless you change. Unless you are transformed. Unless you let the pain of life, which is the only thing strong enough to usually do it, unpackage you and repackage you in different forms. Some have said that all religions can be analyzed in terms of where they situate the real life. Where is the real life? Now, secular Judaism, I was shocked to discover this. I had a lot of secular Jewish friends when I lived in Cincinnati for 15 years. And most of them believed that the real life is now. They did not believe in any concept of eternal life or life after death like most of us would probably take for granted. Uh, And so they're forced to take the now very seriously. It's probably why you'll see so many Jewish people so concerned about peace and justice and their neighbors. Because this is it. Being a good human being, a mensch as they call it, that's it. (laughs) And that's its own reward. Goodness is its own reward, and evil is its own punishment. I think we almost need that for the reform of Christianity. Because what we've done, by and large, is we've pushed the real life into the future. Remember that extreme unction I was talking about? Get it right in the last ten minutes, huh? The good, the real life, is after death. So it makes you sort of schizophrenic. You know, you live in this world and you know you love your children and you know you love this body while you have it and you, none of us want to let go of it, but you know one day it is going to be taken and you've been told that the real life is later, but darn it, it sure feels like the real life is now, doesn't it? <laughs> it feels like those samples and those teases are, are as good as it gets sometimes, those moments of human love and human beauty and human goodness and human music and all the rest. So we very often tend to live a split existence, knowing we should be living for heaven, but let's be honest, this is sort of nice. Well, not always, but a lot of the time it is. I think that is at the heart of our inability to live in the now and to enjoy the now because we're utterly split And we're told that we shouldn't take this moment seriously at all, as if it doesn't matter. Now, I believe the true message of the gospel and the mystery of the incarnation is saying something different than both of those. Not that the real life is 
is now only or later only, but the real life is both now and later. And how you do it now is how it's going to be forever. St. Catherine of Siena said it so well. I've probably quoted this line since I was a young priest, but it still seems to help so many people, so let me quote it here. Catherine said, It's heaven all the way to heaven. And it's hell all the way to hell. How you do anything is how you do everything. How you're doing this moment is how you do life. And, and so that's why you've got to say, how am I doing it? Is it with paranoia? Is it with fear? Is it, is it with attack? Is it with judgment? Brothers and sisters, don't do that. It's going to abort your soul. You will not see correctly. You will not see things as they are. You will not see all the way through. You will not see the divine presence because you'll be judging it and critiquing it and analyzing it and fixing it. That's why atheism is a unique phenomenon of the the intellectual West, which has tried to figure all of this out by the way it thinks instead of the way it sees. Now, if Catherine said, it's heaven all the way to heaven, and it's hell all the way to hell, let me tell you what most Catholics that I meet, I'm sure these are only American Catholics, but most American Catholics think it's heaven all the way to hell. And they think it's hell all the way to heaven. Right? <laughs> Let me explain. They think that the people really having a good time tonight in Liverpool, down in those beautiful English pubs that you have. Uh, we all know they're drunkards and sinners. Um, and we're very happy to know uh, they're having their fun now while we're coming here to a religious, boring day, you know. Uh, but we're very happy to know God is going to burn their behind for all eternity. <laughs> it's heaven all the way to hell, you see. <laughs> and we are putting up with our hell. I bet some of you guys were drugged here by your wives today. You don't even want to be here. But she's trying to save your soul, of course, and listen to this priest. He might have something to tell you. And so you finally resign yourself to, well... It's hell all the way to heaven. I'll put up with these commandments and these boring services and these useless priests, but it might pay my fire insurance dues in case this whole thing is true. I'll be ready at the end. I mean, this is what the church is filled with. I'm making a caricature of it, but it's obvious. People who, who barely believe it are just going along for the ride, There's been no deep experience. There's been no transformative experience. They've never met the great lover. They've never fallen into the great love. It's just a religious game. Paying their fire insurance premiums. And and of course the whole presumption behind it is that God is actually an an eternal punisher. A punitive God. That's what you end up with when you start with this reward punishment system. That is the the bad novel of religion. Not good news at all, but terrible bad news. It's amazing how hesitant and resistant we've been to the gospel, to the good news. Remember, you have to choose. Do I want to be right or do I want to be happy? And most religious people are preoccupied with being right. I don't understand where that came from. Please show me the passage. Find it in the text. Where did Jesus say, this is my commandment, thou shalt be right? Hmm? I mean, where did it come from? I I don't know. This obsession with being right. And it doesn't just destroy the church. It it destroys family life. Where people cannot be vulnerable before one another cannot admit they're wrong or apologize or weep with one another because we're all trained in being right. It doesn't just destroy the church. It destroys marriage and family because no communion is possible there. No participation in the beauty of the flower or the stone or the other comes towards you and inside of you because you keep it blocked with your judgments. Don't go there. 
God has offered you a better place. But remember, all you can do is change yourself. All you can do is clean your lens. And be careful how you see, as Jesus puts it. Or in another place, be careful how you hear. Because how you hear is what you will hear. How you hear, or how you see, is what you will see. So you have to recognize these demons. And I don't know what other word to use that usually have overtaken our heart and our mind and our eyes and our ears already by the age of 25. And they control you the rest of your life. It's like you, you see so many people just stop growing. Nothing new happens. How they do it at 25 is how they're doing it at 50. And I, what a shame when God keeps giving you more chances, more chances and your humility and loveliness and coming here today and being humble enough to try to listen to me, uh, this shows me you want to grow. You don't just like the poor Irishman I told you about this morning, want to be reassured of what you already know. You want to come and see and know something new and something more. You want to learn how to breathe. Yeah. You want to learn and to know that this God is as available as the breath. This God is more present to you than you know how to be present to the stone or the flower or the skies and the seas or even another person. It's all a matter of learning the mystery of presence. People who know how to be present understand. I'm going to make that statement. If you don't know how to be present, if you just keep trying to fix it and control it and explain it with your little head, you'll never get very far in the world of spirituality. And so, so this pronouncing of the name of God is not a head experience. It's a breathing experience. It's a taking in of the universal air and a releasing of the universal air, which finally we all share and rely upon. Yeah. Yeah. There you will learn how to pray. There you will know. There you will not say in days following that I taught you something new. You will say in days following, I hope, I always knew it, but I didn't know it. <laughs> That's exactly what Jacob said when he saw the ladder move, and the angels moving between heaven and earth. He says, you were always here, and I didn't know it. That's the word that always follows every authentic conversion. This was true since the first moment of my being. I did not earn it. I did not achieve it. I did not attain it. I did not get worthy of it somehow, because you won't. I simply more or less collapsed into it. In fact, as C.G. Jung said, where you stumble and fall, that's where you find pure gold. And so Jesus taught us by his way of the cross how not to hold on, but how to let go. And I'm going to make one more absolute in the realm of spirituality. All great spirituality, brothers and sisters, in one sense or another, is about letting go. All great spirituality is about letting go and saying, that's not me. I don't need that anymore. That's not me. I don't need that. I don't need that guilt. I don't need that glory I don't need that praise. I don't need to hold on to that victimhood. I am who I am. And this begins to be enough. If that isn't salvation, tell me what it would be. Tell me. If that isn't the good news, what else would be good news? When you can finally live inside your own body and live inside your own moment and live inside your own self, all the problems perhaps still there but they lose their power to control you. They lose their power to blind you and deafen you. They, they somehow, you, you finally discover, have been the very events that have named you. 
as I've gotten older, I, I'm finding I probably relied far too much in my life on verbal skills and talking. God, for some reason, made it easy for me. But as I get older, I'm more fascinated by poetry than prose. In fact, we're going to give a retreat in New Mexico in a few months on poetry and prayer. And I want to read to you a poem. We plan on just reading one poem every hour. Maybe I'll give a little two-minute tease on the poem and then send them out into the canyons just to be with the words for the next hour. They can come back if they want, or they can stay out there for three hours. But I give you one such poem. And remember, if all these words and these poems don't go to deeper places, nothing's going to be different next Monday. You will have attended another religious day, but you will be the same. And you don't want that to happen, and I don't want that to happen. This poem is by Laura Gilpin, very short. It's called The Two-Headed Calf. Tomorrow, when the farm boys find this freak of nature, they will wrap his body in newspaper and they will carry him to the museum. But tonight, the one night of his life, He is still alive and in the north field, happy with his mother. It is a perfect summer evening. The moon is rising over the orchard, the wind in the grass, and as the two-headed calf stares into the sky, he sees twice as many stars as we do. It's the handicapped ones. It's the broken ones. It's the ones who have to struggle with the woundedness early, who learn to look out at the stars in new and even impossible ways. Thank you.